1968, following a successful appeal to the public for funds, the Natural History Society of South Australia established Murundi Wildlife Reserve specifically to provide a sanctuary for South Australia's own hairy-nosed wombat. Travelling from Adelaide through Mount Pleasant, the first glimpse of the Murray Plains is seen as the road begins to descend the eastern side of the Mount Lofty Ranges. The reserve, consisting of 2,020 hectares of mallee scrub and open grassland, is situated a few kilometres beyond Sedan. At the point of arrival, a notice board provides information to visitors. During the severe drought of 1967-68, the wombats of the area were starving due to the competition of sheep for the meagre food supply. The Society's first project was to build 14 kilometres of fencing to keep the sheep out of the reserve. This was done by contract with help from volunteers. Also, 17 kilometres of old fencing in poor condition was replaced by Society members. A technique was adopted to avoid having to demolish the old fence before erecting the new one. The old wooden posts were jacked out, complete with the fence wires. Then, the bottom of the post was sawn off. Two of the ladies showed that the men were not the only ones who could use a cross-cut saw. The next step was to concrete a new steel post in the original hole and tie the wooden post to it until the next working bee weekend when the concrete would be fully cured. Then, one by one, the old wires were replaced with new ones and tensioned by our project supervisor. While Murundi is almost flat and lacking in scenic grandeur, its appeal to naturalists lies in the variety of flora and fauna that is adapted to the arid climate. About 65% of the reserve is covered by mallee scrub. Speargrass, here highlighted by a late afternoon sun, is sparse in the mallee scrub, so wombat populations, dependent on grass for sustenance, are also low in these areas. Instead, the mallee supports a tremendous variety of bird life. The older trees in the scrub provide hollows for birds, such as the owlet nightjar. The grey thrush, noted for its melodious call, nests in the lower hollows. A young butcher bird. The understory plants in the mallee are many and varied and have continued to improve over the years in the absence of sheep. This is a daisy bush, a species of olearia. Succulent zygophyllum, with its bright yellow flowers. A mallee trunk provides support for olearia magniflora. a colourful succulent called Mariana. Eremophila scoparia is known as emu bush because the berries are eaten by emus. The spiny anteater or echidna is common in the mallee but being a shy creature is not often seen. When it feels threatened it burrows into the soil presenting a formidable array of spines to any potential predator. The two-toed skink is quite common, but seldom seen, as it lives in the sand and leaf litter under the trees. The blind snake lives under logs and stones, where it feeds on ant larvae and termites. Snakes are not at all common on Murundi. This one was disturbed during one of our working bees. 
The Mallee provides cover for a substantial population of kangaroos. Nesting on the ground, the spotted nightjar relies on its natural camouflage to conceal itself while incubating its egg. On the approach of danger, the bird narrows its eyes to slits so that reflection will not betray its presence and will fly off only if absolutely necessary. It lays a single egg on the bare ground with practically no preparation at all. The chick is mobile soon after hatching, but if danger threatens, it instinctively remains absolutely motionless with its eyes closed. Murundi not only has the largest burrowing animal in Australia, but also has the largest beetle, Stigmodera grandis. With a length of 55 millimetres, it makes an impressive sight as it flies through the leaf canopy of the Mallee. Much of the reserve is covered by more open woodland with occasional false sandalwood trees, which in season bear these small white flowers. Also the black tea tree, a species of melaleuca, which in late summer bears a mass of cream, bottle brush-like flowers, a marvellous source of nectar for insects and birds and bright yellow flowering acacias. The weeping potosperum produces conspicuous fruit, which, when ripe, open to expose the seeds within. A very rare tree in the reserve is the hakea with its unique flower. Some trees in the reserve carry mistletoe with bright red flowers an important resource for the mistletoe bird. And there are several species of cassia. Among the smaller plants is Eremophila glabra. And smaller still, Tylotus, covered in fine hairs to reduce moisture loss. In spring, open areas become a mass of yellow, including flowers of goodenia. This plot contains miniature plants of helichrysum and wild geranium only 60 millimetres tall. Much of the colour comes from craspedia or billy buttons. Sleepy lizards appreciate the yellow flowers, not so much for beauty, as for food to their liking. Another lizard found in the open country is the bearded dragon. Geckos are common at Murundi, but being nocturnal are rarely seen. Camouflage is so complete that even the eye is patterned to blend with the surroundings. Resident in the open country is the strikingly marked red-capped robin. Not so flamboyant, but no less important, is the female of the species. Seasonal visitors include the well-known budgerigar. On the ground, a grasshopper makes himself as inconspicuous as possible among lichen-covered pebbles which his camouflage closely resembles. In contrast, a mouse spider relies on a fearsome appearance for his defence. A distinctive region of Murundi Reserve is the open grassland studded with gidgera shrub. It is the favoured home of the spiny-cheeked honey-eater. And the mulga parrot. Because the grassland regions provide their favoured diet, these are the areas containing the majority of the reserve's wombats, whose well-being is the prime purpose of the reserve. The 
maintenance of a good fence is vital to the society's policy of keeping sheep off the reserve and here a working bee is preparing a track along the fence to facilitate regular inspection by the rangers. Tracks were cleared through undulating scrub along the eastern fence and gullies smoothed out with barrow loads of rubble. Clay sections had to be stabilised with rocks so that vehicles would not get bogged in wet weather. In the beginning, the society felt obliged to provide water so that the animals would not have to leave the security of the reserve to drink. A water hole simulating a natural rock hole was built. While it is here being filled with a bucket, it is normally fed by a ball valve from tanks which collect rainwater from a catchment roof. It soon became very popular with noisy visitors like ravens. Galahs and mulga parrots. A male mulga parrot jumps in for a drink. Another wades in and has a good wash. A mallee ringneck parrot. White fronted honey eaters. A grey butcher bird. Spiny cheeked honey eater. Dusky wood swallows. And one of their young. A spotted paddle oat. Yellow plumed honey eater. Brown headed honey eaters. A singing honey eater. A black winged karawong eyes the camera with some apprehension. But a cheeky willy wagtail has no such fears and with a flurry of feathers and water takes a bath. A juvenile brown goshawk comes down to drink. Always the last bird of the day to come to drink is the common bronze wing. He stretches his wing before flying off to a safe roost for the night. In the early morning sunlight, a kangaroo approaches the waterhole. He listens carefully for sounds of danger. And finally comes in to drink. The first water point was so successful that another was installed in the northern part of the reserve. Materials were pre-cut, ready for assembly on the site. My son Gary and I spent a week on the first stage of construction. With the help of friends, the water point was brought into operation on the 12th of June, 1972. Demand for water so increased that in September 1976 it became necessary to supplement the storage capacity at both water points. Two new tanks arrived at the reserve after a long slow trip from Adelaide. The working group mixed concrete by hand. and laid a smooth, flat base for the new tank. The group views the finished product. On the next working bee, the two tanks roll in, ready for installation, thereby doubling the capacity of the facility. 
A similar procedure was adopted at water point number two. Demand for water continued to increase and it became necessary to extend the size of the roof, providing 50% more catchment area. Keeping with the policy that the reserve should also be educational, the Society opened a nature trail in August 1980. This group was responsible for its preparation. An official opening was arranged and guests enjoyed a picnic lunch prior to the formal ceremony. Our public officer, Alwyn Clements, addressed the assembled guests. and Glenn Taylor cut the ribbon. Groups were then conducted over the nature trail and here they inspect the remains of Woodcutter's old campsite. Working bees for various projects are scheduled once a month and most participants stay overnight. It was decided that some basic facilities should be provided, so we set to work digging a hole. A frame was erected on a concrete slab over the hole, and our toilet was complete. Working bee projects are many and varied. This group is busy cutting weeds. like this stemless thistle with its many flower heads. The program has been very successful and these weeds are now relatively rare on the reserve. Nevertheless, constant vigilance is needed to ensure they do not re-establish themselves. Another job is the occasional repainting of the numbers on the nature trail. The land that is now Murundi Wildlife Reserve has been profoundly changed by activities of the past. Besides being grazed by sheep for more than a century, many of the trees were cut for firewood. During World War II, when petrol was in short supply, many motor vehicles were fitted with gas producers fuelled by charcoal. The charcoal was made by controlled burning of wood in these pits. During the Society's exploration of the new reserve, this ruin of a woodcutter's hut was discovered. Along with discarded bottles and jars. Over the years, termites had eaten the main structural supports and the roof had collapsed. Two of us decided to restore the hut and attempt to unravel its history. We excavated the floor of the building, sifting every shovel full of soil. We discovered worn axe heads, buttons, a penny, a cigarette holder and fragments of a newspaper dating the ruin to 1942. A smoothing iron was unearthed so apparently he took some interest in his appearance. A boot, the leather dried and shriveled. We gained enough information to reconstruct the hut as an accurate replica of the original. Six posts were set up to support beams over which a raft of mallee poles was laid. The surplus ends were cut off using a cross-cut saw typical of the era. Over the raft of poles, jute bags were laid, and the whole roof covered in a thick layer of soil. The end result was a very neat little hut, well insulated from the outside extremes of summer heat and winter cold. At times I have camped here during my ranger duty and found it very cosy preparing an evening meal by the fire. 
The hut stands as a memorial to an era ending in the 1940s that exploited the Mallee, leaving only the stumps. The regrowth from those old stumps is the scrub we see here today. The change in the area since it became a reserve is quite dramatic. Former drought saw many wombats wandering in daylight searching for fragments of vegetation which might sustain them. In good seasons, wombats rarely come out during the day. Weakened by hunger, some lay above their burrows, getting from the sun warmth that would normally be derived from their food. There appears to be very little near this warren to sustain a wombat. But the same warren, in a good season six years after the reserve was established, is surrounded by good pasture. This healthy, well-rounded wombat is evidence of the better conditions they now enjoy. 1973 and 1974 brought exceptional seasons. Almost double the average rainfall fell in the two successive years producing incredible growth of plants. Here the spear grass is waist high. Greenhood orchids appeared. Eucalypts germinated for the first time in decades and flourished. To assess progress at Murundi, I've undertaken my own project to determine trends in wombat population. This has taken me to the reserve on many weekends, sometimes camping alone, but often with my two sons, who, besides fiddling with the fire, have rendered invaluable assistance. The first step in the study was to make a comprehensive examination of the entire reserve and map the warrens. A simple alidade was used for mapping. Over 600 warrens were found, varying from huge complexes of more than 60 burrows down to warrens comprising of a single burrow. In most places, the wombats burrow under the limestone shelf. In several areas, burrows are dug in clay soil, but these are usually temporary, as in wet seasons they tend to collapse. Occasionally, during the regular inspections, we would catch a glimpse of a wombat out in daylight and was once fortunate enough to be able to creep up and pat a sleeping wombat. This spiky old stump is an ideal scratching post for the wombats. To study the wombat's daily routine, a recording device has been set up in a warren to record the arrivals and departures of the wombats. Wiring from the recorder goes to each burrow where a switch, actuated when a wombat pushes through, transmits a signal to the recorder. Occasionally I utilise the switch to trigger a camera enclosed in this weatherproof housing. The housing is left in place to allow the wombats to get accustomed to it. Even so, my attempts to get a photo of a wombat resulted in a series of dismal failures. In the first attempt, the wombat was in such a hurry that all I got was the cloud of dust as the wombat disappeared down his burrow. The next try showed the least handsome part of his anatomy. Eventually, patience was rewarded with a good view of one of the subjects of my study. The activity recorder is driven by an electric clock mechanism and advances a waxed paper chart at the rate of 30 millimeters per day. Each time a wombat leaves or enters through any of the switches, the event is registered on the chart by a solenoid operated stylus. 
The chart shows that a wombat made four excursions from one of the burrows during the night. The exact time of each event shown on the chart is read using a specially designed measuring microscope. The results of the chart analysis and data collected in two study areas indicate that the wombats emerge almost exclusively at night and that more activity occurs during wet seasons than dry seasons. They also show a healthy trend in the population in relation to changing seasons. There is every indication that in Murundi Wildlife Reserve the hairy-nosed wombats are thriving. It is to be hoped that their paths will lead them to a very bright and secure future.